Terry Roses, my name from Southern Cross University. We're here at Zenfeld's uh, roastery and coffee plantation. Today we have a field day looking at some cover crops that we're planting um, between the coffee trees uh, in their orchard. So we're, we're looking at two things. We wanted to look and see whether the cover crops had any effect on insects, that's either pollinators or other beneficial insects. And we're also looking to see whether these cover crops have any effect on the soil. So I'm standing in one of our winter cover crops that was planted a few months ago. We've got a mix of species in here. We've got some uh, mustard, some radish, um, some rye corn and a, a few other odds and ends as well as the native grasses and other grasses that we're here to start with. I'm a crop agronomist but funnily enough even though this is a coffee plantation we're kind of looking at crops in the inner row so that's fine. It's a 33 year old coffee farm so John's parents planted back in 1987 working closely with the Department of Agriculture with the available varieties of the time which they've done research on back up at Wallingbar. Um, so mostly we're seeing a variety called K7, which won't mean much to you, except you will notice that they tend to grow taller than we might like. We're certainly pushing the boundaries of the age of the coffee trees. We're told by agronomists working in coffee lands overseas that after 10 years, maybe up to 15, they'll start to pull them out and, and replant. We haven't done that to much extent. So we've, we're working with those challenges of having older trees. Apart from that challenge, what we've chosen to do for at least seven years now is uh, be able to produce our coffee without any chemical input, particularly out of fertilisers. We certainly understand we've got to do this for years. This is not something that should just stop in three years' time and say, these, these are the results and is it, is it good, bad or neutral? I think it's something that we want to build on and we really think that that nutrition builds up in the soil over the years with more to come, the more diversity and more biodiversity of plants we bring in. As I said, there's two aspects to this, well, the whole project. So we've got um, a couple of coffee farms that are also doing it on three macadamia properties and uh, one avocado farm. So that's one of the eight projects that were funded to the Region Ag Alliance by the Department of Ag, Forestry and Fisheries. But we're looking at um, both soil in these ones and also because a lot of growers will plant these cover crops, not just for soil, but actually for the insect benefit. Now in um, the last decade that insects are declining all over the world and um, there's various reasons for this. Um, we haven't done huge amount of studies in Australia um, over time looking at uh, insect populations to see how much they've declined in Australia. Uh, particularly in Europe we've seen um, studies that have published over sort of 30 year periods so and have seen up to 75% decline in insect diversity which um, you know is, is, is really quite a, a scary thing for us. Um, in humanity wise. Um, so there's um, different things of wise to look after um, uh, insects and encourage insects. So there's uh, sort of the moral side, a social licensed farm, and that we are actually um, you know, maintaining biodiversity. Um, and then there's the biological aspects, which uh, I'm sort of more concerned about in my work, I guess, which is um, biological control. So um, Particularly, there's different types of biological control where you may uh, introduce um, insects, classical biological control things. Um, and then there's uh, conservation biological control, which is actually building resilience into your farming system. So you're actually creating habitats and resources for insects that um, actually takes um, a lot of seasons, a lot of years to actually build up. And the idea is that you're having um, pest resilient uh, farms. Don't get bitten by bees. <laughs> In terms of biomass contribution, there's a bit of a range over the sites, so there's not really a consistent trend. Some of them had heaps of biomass in cover crop compared to, well, control just means what's there already. And that what we do with that is it just doesn't get mown. Um, and then we compare the two. For the summer one, um, we've got huge amounts of biomass. So if you look on the other side of the sheet, you know, we're getting 1,500 plus to 3,000, um, whereas in winter we're only getting around 500. So that's, that's kilograms of biomass per hectare. Yeah. So that's, we cut them off, we dry them out. So different plants have different amounts of water in them. So if you just weigh it, you don't know how much is water. So we dry them and we call it dry matter or biomass. So in summer, yeah, up to three tonnes, which is pretty good. Yeah. 
So I've shown you what species were here, and you note that the the big um, brown one is smother grass, sweet smother grass, which is this stuff. You can't really see it very well. It's the only one we've actually planted. It's, that's right. So you've got smother grass and then broadleaf paspalum, which is this guy, um, this one here. And so they're both shade tolerant. So most things that grow here are shade tolerant, right? They, they're shaded most year. And so anything that survives over the years has got to be able to handle limited light. And so all the species that are on this list are pretty good with shade. Microlina is an Australian native, loves the shade. Um, yes. Basket grass, another Australian oh, little native, right. little flat leaf, fat leaf thing. Um, another native, it also loves the shade. So they're shade lovers. But in some of the orchards we've planted at, for example, one of the macadamia orchards, the species that were there were actually winter dominant. So prairie grass was a big one. It's, it's an introduced grass. That was one of the sites we got poor emergence. And the reason is we're sowing crops in winter in, in a, a pasture or whatever you want to call it, an interrow that's got winter dominant species. So they're competing with it. So as ours are trying to emerge and get away, you've got those other winter grasses, the prairie grass in particular, it already had big roots, a lot of energy. It quickly outcompeted it. Whereas here, because most of the species are summer dominant, as soon as it gets cooler in winter, they slow down. So you can see, you can see here that the one that's growing, this is the prairie, this is prairie grass, this fella, it's actually trying to grow. All these others, they're just gonna sit there for the winter. They don't grow over winter. They're they're tropical type grasses. And so it's very easy to establish winter cover crops into those summer ones because you're not competing with the summer grasses. So local graziers will do that, you know, they might have Kaikuyu, Ceteria pastures, huge growth over the summer, nothing in winter. So they'll graze them low and then they'll over sow with ryegrass or some winter species to, to bolster that feed in winter. Well, it's the same thing. And you notice with the biomass production here in winter, we've got more biomass production out of the cover crop row than in the inter row. And the reason is because most of the inter row over there, it's just the summer grass is having a rest over the winter. We planted some winter species that are going to make more biomass. With the summer cover crop, the inner rows or the, the control rows produce the same biomass as our summer cover crop. And the reason is because they're growing in summer anyway. All right, so there's, there's horses for courses and, and that all kind of plays into it. Because one, one of the things I slightly worry about with the summer cover crop, we've got an, a lovely perennial base here. So you read a lot in literature or you'll see online or in blogs or when people give talks, cover cropping in orchards does wonderful things to the soil. It does this, that, and the other thing. But when you look at the system they were setting it up in, quite often it might be, say, a vineyard out that's irrigated in semi-arid areas. Their control is bare soil. Quite often they're cultivating between their rows. So they've got scorched earth versus a cover crop. And clearly having plants, carbon is going to benefit. Our control here, Beck and John have done a great job. It's completely covered, which is exactly what you want when you've got a high rainfall um, and sloping land, you don't want bare ground for erosion. So our control is pretty good to start with. It's also got, you know, 10 to 15 species. That was just what I found when I threw out my quadrant. Um, it hasn't even got the magic pinto peanut, which is no. my favourite ground cover. And there's blocks of it over there, which is a, this ground dwelling legume that fixes nitrogen. And um, it's a lovely thing, isn't it? It's a beautiful thing. Above all, regardless of any effects we have of these, I think the key is you can only improve your soil if it's still there. There's no point in us building the carbon and then if it ends up in the creek. So having that ground cover has got to be our first priority. And then anything on top of that, having different species, I think is a, just an added bonus. But keeping that ground cover at all times is critical. So when we want to build soil carbon and, and protect it and draw it down, you want stable carbon. And that stable carbon is the carbon that the bugs can't go and eat. So it's great. For sequestering carbon but in terms of bug food you want what we call labile carbon which is the juicy stuff which is what these plants pump out from their roots and it's also if you slash them the carbon going into the soil is great food for microbes so the labile carbon or water soluble carbon it's the same thing i've shown there that tends to equate so often if we find an increase in that other microbial parameters tend to follow and that makes sense because that's their food source. So the other one we've shown is the respiration, which means it's basically like we do. Bugs eat things and breathe CO2, carbon dioxide, back out. So their respiration 
Um, it's commonly known as there's a Haney test that you can get done overseas and there's other forms of respiration. The only difference is I think Haney measures how much they respire, maybe in four hours, some tests measure in two hours, some give them 16. Basically, how much carbon dioxide can you breathe out? And that just shows how quickly they're eating and, and carrying on. So it's a, a sort of a, a test of how active your microbes are. So in terms of the water-soluble carbon I've shown there, we sowed the cover crop back in last winter. This was our first cover crop last winter. In September, there was not much difference. So that was early in cover crop growth. We didn't detect much difference in water-soluble carbon between this and the control plots. And I've got little error bars there because we've actually got four of these strips and four control plots going across. By October, we had more labile carbon in the cover crop treatment. Any guesses why? I haven't done a very good job of no, explaining, you, have I? I'm just leaving it for someone else to answer the question. Because it was more carbon going into the soil. So remember, that, that winter cover crop, in the control treatment, you've got these summer grasses and they're, they're sort of dormant. So they're not pumping out. They're not photosynthesizing heaps. They're not growing. They're not pumping carbon into the soil. Whereas by October, these guys, because they're winter active on top, they're drawing in a lot more sunlight. They're converting it to, to sugars, pumping it out through their roots, turning over the lower leaves of senescing so they're feeding the bugs. So that's why we get an increase in labile carbon. Funnily enough, in the summer cover crop, we haven't got that data yet, but my guess would be we won't have more labile carbon in the cover crop because those summer grasses in the control, they're going to be doing their thing. So short story is these winter cover crops okay. do seem to be improving our soil health. And provided that we can do so in a way that we don't expose the soil at all to erosion, because you can just get the odd random 300 mil rainfall event around here that can come seems to come whenever it feels like without a, a whole amount of warning and and the last thing you want is too much bare ground so provided we can get these cover crops established without sort of ruining our perennial base they look like they're a bit of a winner you can definitely eat the daikon i probably wouldn't eat the rykorn well you could if it set seed the ends of radish, yeah. Canola, the ones that set seed, you can eat some canola. Crush it for oil. <laughs> well, that's what it's <laughs> 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 Taste gross when you just chew it.